Good morning. Good morning. morning. There you are. Uh, Jim, thanks for uh, saying I'm doing important work at Highpoint University. Most of the time our colleagues in ministry, they just think, Preston, do you just play hacky sack and go to fraternity parties? What do you what do you do all day there? Uh, no, it is important work. I'm grateful. And uh, choir, I look forward to hearing y'all later. It's one of my great pleasures of coming back to David's United Methodist Church and hearing y'all sing. Uh, we did not get the memo about uh, no robes uh, this morning. <laughs> Can help us out a little bit. Uh, I've said this in years past when I come back to Davidson. It's a great gift to come home and to get to preach. Uh, it's uh, not like Scripture that says that a prophet is not welcome in his own home. I'm very welcomed here. It's, I'm grateful for that. And it's, but it's uh, the Meaning for that is that it's great to come home to a place of people who knew you before you knew yourself. And what I want to share with you all often when I come here is that you've got to know that you've got such rich goodness here. And sometimes if you're so close to something, you can't always see the grace that's there. Uh, it's just it's so rich here. Um, came back from annual conference last night, Lake Junaluska, where it's the best of times and the worst of times in United Methodism. Uh, but like the people who are leading at David's United Methodist Church, man... Y'all have just got some of the most incredible folks sharing in ministry with you. And then even last night, uh, Katie Sherrill was ordained uh, as a deacon uh, who comes out of this church. So she joins the ranks of those who've come through this church, heard their calling, and come through it. And so it's like, it's, it's just, we're so grateful to you who've seen that in us before we saw it in ourselves. So thank you. This passage this morning is rich. Uh, it reminds me of the story, parable kind of story. Young boy, he's on a riverboat uh, going down the Mississippi River. And he stumbled into the captain's deck, and, he's, and the captain, he, he should be looking out at the water, but he's not. He's, he's like reading a newspaper, he's drinking coffee, and the little boy looks at him, and the little boy looks out on the water, looks at him, looks at the water, and he starts to notice in the water, there's all these rocks. And he looks at the captain, looks at the water again, looks back at the captain, says, hey, 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 do you know where all the rocks are out there? And the captain doesn't even look up, he just kind of glances over at the boy and says, no. Uh, but I know where the deep water is. <laughs> I don't know uh, what you came to do this morning, but we come here to find deep water. You don't know where all the rocks are in your life. We don't know where all the rocks are in church life going forward. But you, you know when you come here, whether in spite of ourselves or what the richness is of God, you're going to find some deep water. And you get some in this passage this morning. I hear three things in it. You know, any good sermon's got to have three things. Uh, I hear three things like in this passage of, of who we often are, who we want to be, and who God might want us to be. This is that rich passage. It says, uh, we boast in our suffering because suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame. Hmm. Boast in our suffering. Not something many of us think we could do. I I, I appreciate our tradition and I appreciate following Jesus and I appreciate Scripture too. Is that It just makes note that most of our life, whether we want to admit it or not, will have a good bit of suffering in it. This This Christian thing, it's not Pollyanna. It's not power of positive thinking. It takes suffering that it's real and it's in our lives and we're in it day in, day out sometimes. And so it doesn't ignore it. It presses us into it and says, pay attention to it. Don't be in denial of it. I mean, you could open the first couple pages of Scripture and you get to Exodus, and it's a people in deep suffering, and they cry out to God. God hears their cries. God still hears those cries today. He hears the cries from Ukraine. He hears the cries in your own heart. He hears the cries. You go a little further, you might come into something like, you know, you come into Ecclesiastes, and you hear there's a season for all things, a season for weeping, a season for laughing. Which is helpful if you come up to a passage like this, right? And you hear boast in your suffering. Maybe you're just not in that kind of place. Now now is the season where I'm in tears or my food day and night, as the psalmist would say. Or you're with psalmist like Psalm 13 saying, Oh my God, how long will you forget my face? I mean, these are real things that Scripture offers us. And there are companions when we're in those seasons, but as someone wisely once said, the opposite of profound truth is another profound truth. And maybe there is something for us in that we boast in our suffering. Maybe for a people, for myself, maybe some of us who are conditioned to simply be pain avoidant. 
I think this could be us a lot of times. We're pain avoidant people. We want to live happy lives. We want to live exciting lives. We don't want to live painful lives. Who wants that? Uh, one of the, my favorite books in the last five, six years is a book called Being Mortals, written by a surgeon, uh, Atul Gawande. And he says that like in medicine, we've even missed this about being so pain avoidant, we miss the purpose of what medicine is. And he says this, he says, we've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival. But really, it is larger than that. It's to enable well-being. In the end, people don't view their life as merely the average of all its moments, which after all is mostly nothing plus some sleep. For human beings, life is meaningful because it is a story, a story where something happens. Measurements of people's minute-by-minute level of pleasure and pain miss the fundamental aspect of human existence. A seemingly happy life may be empty. A seemingly difficult life may be devoted to a great cause. We have purposes larger than ourselves. We be something about we boast in our suffering that could be a corrective to us people who desire to live pain-free lives and long lives, but then somehow miss that we were supposed to live meaningful lives. We've got our loves wrong. We looked for longevity and we missed a deeper love. We looked for quantity and therefore lost quality of life and who we were supposed to be. There's consequences for being a pain-avoidant people. I'm in higher education. We see this all the time. Um, you may have heard something about, uh, like, helicopter parenting. Okay, if you don't, here, here's what helicopter parenting is, that you love your child so much that uh, the way you express that love, you got to hover over them. you got to make sure that nothing goes wrong. you got to make sure that nothing happens to them. Like, but something's got to happen to them. It's the only way you get a story. It's the only way you get a life. We hear this. I could see it like every year I will talk to some beautiful parent who just says, please don't let anything happen to my child. I know what they mean at its best, but it's like something's got to happen. Uh, in higher education, we pray for days of, uh, of helicopter parents because now we're in the age of bulldozer parenting. <laughs> some of them are ahead of me. So bulldozer parenting, it's, it's where like, you, you love your child so much, but the, the way you express that love is that any obstacle potentially painful in front of you, you got to mow it down. Like, you, you want them to live happy lives. Like, so you, you take down things in front of them that could potentially harm them, but also could potentially produce endurance, could potentially produce character. We wring our hands all the time of why the uh, growth and mental illness or health issues for young folks and like... Uh, we reap what we sow. The problem isn't principally with them. It's with us who've coached them, taught them, raised them. And the way that we've expressed love is to knock things down. And we've got to listen closely to what we're doing when we do stuff like that. Because what we're saying to them is that this life is very hard. This world is difficult. But we don't think you can do it. And then we wonder where the struggle comes from. You see? There may be a corrective for us in something about we boast in our sufferings, that we actually might be doing life well if some suffering comes. We actually might be following Jesus well if some suffering comes. That we actually might be in the world as Jesus is. And if this works in the most intimate parts of our life, it could also work in macro and bigger parts of our lives. Like, what's a people who've become so pain avoidant? Well, you can't talk about historical racism or systematic racism. That's just too painful. We've got to protect feelings. Like, so you end up being the kind of people who ban books because they're just too much for you. Can you see it? No. There's a corrective here that Paul offers. It's like, you boast in your suffering maybe if you follow Jesus because then maybe you're entering the world as he would have us. It could be hard, but it'll be potentially more meaningful, powerful, purposeful. We boast in our suffering because suffering produces endurance. Endurance. Another word that's used here is actually patience. I like patience more. If you were to open James 1, the reading goes like this. It's maybe even more forceful. It says, uh, it says be joyful when, you, when, you, uh, when trials come your way. Be joyful when, uh, when trials come your way. Uh, when I think about this word patience, uh, I think of my little boy. 
Uh, I've got three sons, and, and they're, they are the light of my life, and I try not to be a bulldozer or helicopter parent uh, as best I can. Uh, we were having uh, uh, one of our parent-teacher conferences for one of them recently, and uh, this is Father's Day, and I just got to thinking about how much my father did indeed get right. <laughs> if you called our house, the Davis household, in the 80s and 90s, one, you would get the long cord phone in the kitchen. That's what we had, right? Don't you miss those? Like, you would get the long phone, you would get the cord in the kitchen, and that phone, that one phone, and if my dad was home, you would get this. This is Davis residence, proud father of Michael Davis. This is the Davis residence, proud father of Preston Davis. This is the Davis residence, adoring husband of Robbie Davis. <laughs> and we would say, stop. It's embarrassing. And now it gives me so much joy because I know exactly what he's talking about. Like, so much pride, proud parent. We're in this parent-teacher conference for one of our boys, and it's just glowing, and he's doing so well, and I'm so proud of him. And I'm like, it was, you, he's the best student you've got. You should thank your lucky stars you've got him. And then, and then she like gets toward the end of the conversation and says, there is one thing we've got to talk about. Uh, see, he, he, he finishes, well, he doesn't quite finish. He's the first to get done with his work. But he doesn't finish the work. And I thought, where have I heard that before? And I heard it right here in this church. And Jody Seymour, he wasn't in the pulpit. He'd roam around up here. And he looked out at all of us. And he said, oh, you folks, I love you to death. Uh, you're so fast. You're making great time. But you all seem to me like you're getting lost while you're doing it. Like what is us for us people who become impatient with life? And we get fast and we get quick. And therefore we get lost. And we don't know who we are. So busy trying to be first, trying to be on top, you end up accidentally having a race to the bottom. My favorite passages in Scripture is the story of Jacob and Esau. Maybe it's about twins because I raised twins, but Jacob is a heel. He's fast. He's impatient. He wants to get ahead in life. And so he steals. He connives. He takes. Until one day, I don't know how old he is, but one day it's a, fit, it's a, it's a, it's a fitful sleep. It's a wrestling sleep. It's not any sleep at all. It's, scripture says he wrestles with a man, an angel. Is it God? It's unclear who he's wrestling with. And in the wrestling, it goes all through the night. In the morning, God, angel, himself, whoever it is, at the end of that, he, almost daybreak, says, let me go. And Jacob says, no, I won't let you go until you bless me. And he gets a blessing, but it's with his hip taken out of socket. Such a beautiful metaphor for, like, for us who need to learn to be more patient with life. There's just no way we're going to get out of here without some wound. There's no way we're going to get out of here without some heartbreak. There's no way we're going to get through this life without some of that. And in so doing, we actually become wiser. We actually become more wholehearted, even if it's our hearts are broken open. We limp. But we'll limp with the God who's right there by our side, who cultivates who we're actually supposed to be. Jacob gets his name from Jacob to Israel in that moment. He lives into his real name. Like, I wonder if we often miss who we're called to be and who we are because we're so pain avoidant. And Jesus is trying to take us into those places in beautiful ways. Not masochistic ways, but healing ways. We boast in our suffering because suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. If we're often people who are pain avoidant, like I think I get our best. Oh, man, we want to be people of character, don't we? We want to be people of high performance and deep integrity. This is who we want to be, people of character. Uh, we use words today like grit, resilience. In education, we call it growth mindset. It's all dressed up for what the ancients would call stoicism. Stoicism, a high performing, deep integrity, a deep kind of inner will that can't be broken. If you want to read more about this, there's great books on it. Ryan Holiday's written a book, a book called, um, called The Obstacle at the, as the Way, and the main metaphor he uses for this is excellent. He says, like, uh, there is something that actually is different from anything in nature, and it's fire. And fire is incredible because, you know, everything else in nature, if it comes up to something that's blocking it, if it's an obstacle, like you, like you and I, we've got to go around it, we've got to go over it. 
Uh, like, it's like we're going on a bear hunt, going to catch a big one. You, know, you get, well, can't go over it, can't go under it. Like fire, it's got to go through it. But what fire does is that anything that's in front of it, 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 it becomes very fuel for it to grow larger. The thing that actually was impeding it or you thought was a conflict or the thing that you thought was getting in your way is actually the very thing that's going to make for more character in you. Like you were impatient with it and you just wanted to push back past it, but actually you've got to pay attention to it. And if you pay attention to it, it actually might cultivate more of who you are. Uh, the, the basketball coach at Duke, uh, the women's basketball team, uh, without Krzyzewski there, you've got to pay attention to her. She's amazing. Uh, she, uh, she writes about what character is. Or she talks to her students about it, her players. Her name's Kara Lawson. She played in the WNBA. She's an Olympi- Olympian. I won a gold medal. Uh, and she's got these incredible speeches about forming character in her students and her players. And she says, uh, essentially most of us just miss it all the time. What we're looking for in our life is like say, is something along the lines of, this too shall pass. Instead of, this too shall shape me. And how will this shape me? She's looking at her players one practice and she says, she says, everyone is always looking for, if I can just get to something, something and such, it'll get easier. Like, if I can just get to Tuesday, it'll be easier. If I can just get to noon, like, it'll be easier. Like, so many of us fall into this again and again. And then she looks around at her players, she looks around at the other coaches, and she says, uh, oh, Sarah, you, you're in your young 30s, and you've got two kids. Has it gotten easier yet? No. Uh, Dawn, you're in your 50s. Has it gotten easier yet for you? No. Instead of going, when will it get easier? Our job for you, to her players, she says, is to help you handle hard better. Help you handle hard better. That's fire. It's beautiful boast in our suffering because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and then character produces hope and hope will not put us to shame as Paul says what do we need with hope we've already got fire as Paul knows something about himself he knows something about you and me he knows something about how our own hearts turn in on themselves He knows about even our best laid plans with the highest intentions and most purest and virtuous aspects to them have a tendency to become wrapped up in self-interest and selfishness. We call it sin, but it's just us again and again. Like, I just, that's just who we are so often. I love what Dr. King, he named it so well in the 60s. He says, we live in a time of guided missiles and misguided men. Like, what is it to be able to, to unravel the secrets of the universe in an atom and then you make a bomb out of it? Like all of us, like we're just such intelligent creatures and we're going to use it for good, but somehow it gets turned for evil. Like you can be a person of great character and you become a person who handles hard better, but then what happens if you don't pay attention? You become kind of hard yourself. You become a kind of hammer. And a hammer can only do one thing. Paul says, no, you need hope. And hope's not something you can do. Hope is a gift. Hope is something of God that can only come from beyond you. And it's not something you can complete. It's something you've got to lean into. It's risky because hope, like, it requires relationship. Hope can't be like this. Hope is always like this. It's open-handed. Because the trap, the trap of handling hard better constantly where it makes you hard, the trap is this. You might actually be able to push back some of the pain of the world, but in the end, you only increase it for the world. Got to have better eyes than that, Paul says. We boast in our suffering because suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope will not not put you to shame. Someone who's become hard, they can't risk hope because it might just put them to shame. It might just look too much like weakness, but no, Jesus, he redefines what strength is, and strength looks like this with wounded hands. Says that's what reality looks like. We want to be strong. Jesus wants, to have, wants us to have the strength to almost look weak when we serve in this world. Uh, as earlier this year, I was working with a colleague. We'd gone through a really difficult season, uh, and we were uh, helping a time, a 
of grieving, and we were in her office, and she's one of these folks uh, who has quotes all over the room. She's like a live, laugh, love person. Do you know these people? If you don't know these people, you are these people. <laughs> and that's okay. I love you. And like, it was, we were, it had been a long day. We were there late at night, and I finally looked on the wall, and she had one that said, what you focus on grows. Oof. What you focus on grows. It occurs to me of this cadence that Paul puts together. If you focus on any one of those individually, suffering, suffering might grow if you only focus on the suffering. Like, endurance might actually grow if you just pay attention to only endurance. Character might grow if you only just pay attention to character. Hope might grow if you pay attention to hope. But if you pay attention to them all together and how God has so ordained things and shaped things, it's just miraculous. It's like if you focus on God with that, it's like it takes all of them and we realize that somewhere along the way what was going to be meant for evil, God turns for good somehow in our lives. Or if you just focus on the face of Jesus, you just look at him, and you see all of it in complete picture. And the one who stands with the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable with the suffering. The one who endures the cross and pain of the world with people and for people. Whew. One whose character is so rich that we ache and long for it. The one who shows us how to hope and how to live into it in this world, even in the bleakest moments. When I think of the nature of who God is, and if you just focus on that, I think of this film. It came out a few years ago, Ray, about Ray Charles, his story. And it's pretty early on in the story, and it's pretty early on in his life, that he and his mom, they realize he's going blind, and there's nothing they can do about it. This will be his reality. And so she says to him, Ray, we're going to do something. Uh, like whenever we do anything in this in this house, I will show you one time. I will tell you a second time. But on the third time, you you've got to do it. And so she does this uh, for almost everything they do in their house, and then it finally gets that we know he's going to have to learn. And there's a moment where she's in the kitchen. It's one room hut. It's kitchen. It's bedroom. It's living room. It's everything. It's just one room shack. And he comes into the house, and he hits the threshold of the house and falls onto the floor and you can tell he's in agony and he's wailing and crying and he's not just crying, he's crying out, Mama! Mama! <laughs> Mama! And her desire is to leap in. She stands back and he's still crying, Mama, for a little while longer and then he gets more patient. And he sits there for a moment. He collects himself, and he hears a cricket. A little grin comes on his face, and he goes and he grabs the cricket, and he hears the cricket. And then from behind him, he hears this. <sighs> he says, I hear you too, Mama. Why are you crying? And she's the one who's seen all the affliction he's been through and will go through, and all the endurance he'll have to have or discover and all the character it will form, and all the hope that is now in her heart. She says, because I'm so happy. I don't know who you think God is, but God's something like that. God who is minimum protection, but maximum support. Who shows up in our lives as a wounded healer and says, come, follow me. Thanks be to God.